this movie was perfectly imperfect. Hello interwebs, I hope you're all doing well, and I am here to review the latest MCU movie and what may possibly be the last Guardians of the Galaxy movie and certainly the last Guardians movie directed by one James Gunn who started the franchise, this one, Volume 3. And I have to be honest with you, it, it feels so incredibly good to walk out of a Marvel movie, not just satisfied, not just feel like I was watching the next installment of like a product line that was just made to continue the brand over and over again, but feel like I had a complete experience that was not only telling me a complete story, but one that felt personal, felt like it was trying to say something specific and meaningful and, and honestly just really, really touched me. Uh, I should not have uh, been surprised by that, given that this is James Gunn, and uh, I have made no bones about the fact that James Gunn is, uh, if not one of my favorite filmmakers, is certainly one of my favorite filmmakers working in sort of blockbuster cinema, because he feels like one of the very few directors out there who can make a big blockbuster movie underneath like a Hollywood studio and still make that movie feel personal and, and, and relatable on a very uh, intimate and, and empathetic way. Uh, and that is a really big skill for any filmmaker, but for a filmmaker to do that when they also have to deal with large brands like Marvel and I'm sure a million fingers in the pie uh, that were sort of having eyes on this, especially as a final movie, uh, it is a huge credit to James Gunn's uh, skill as a filmmaker. And, and that's why I've always really loved him, because there is sort of a, a constant message throughout all of his work. And uh, I will I will say that uh, I did a whole video essay, I think it's like a two and a half hour video essay, um, on my main channel about him. And I'll also be frank that uh, I have been taking notes uh, the entire time that I was sort of thinking about this movie because I just sort of came out of the cinema. Uh, and there will almost definitively be another video essay analyzing this movie. So basically what you're gonna be getting with this review is like the cliff notes or like the outline version of that video essay because frankly, this movie was not only a, an excellent film, but quite possibly, and I know I, I might be a little bit hyperbolic considering I just walked out of the cinema, but I, I might uh, end up finding that this will be my favorite uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movie and certainly one of my favorite MCU movies of all time because not only did it manage to wrap out the Guardians uh, sort of story, and if we get more Guardians stories after this, I would love it, but it really felt like an end to, especially James Gunn's uh, version of these characters and storyline with these characters. Uh, but it also felt like a very political and targeted movie as well, and we will talk about that in just a second when I go into like full spoilers, because I need to talk about everything with this movie. Um, and. And, certain, and when I say political, I mean this movie is like overtly, overtly political and like trying to say something about society and about America today. It is not as political as say something like Peacemaker was, uh, James Gunn's uh, DC Comics TV show that he did that was very political. I mean, that show literally ends with uh, with uh, Peacemaker fighting uh, p the police and Nazis. <laughs> so like, it's it's very over, uh, that one is. This is less on the nose, but not, not, not too much less on the nose uh, with this one. I was honestly shocked that um, Marvel let James Gunn get get as far with what he was saying with this film as he does uh, in a lot of ways. And it's it's just barely beneath, it's, it's subtextual, but just, just, you like scratch a little bit and you're like, oh, I see what you're saying here. We'll talk about all of that. But beyond that, he manages to take these sort of big ideas, this big wrap out, and give every single character in this story a personal moment that shows that they have grown and changed since their first appearance in the uh, in the film. The most obvious version of that is Rocket. Uh, Rocket's storyline throughout this is, is amazing, and I will talk about that towards the end of this video. I'll save that for my biggest discussion because there's so much to say about Rocket's storyline that just gutted me, and there were so many moments where the story just had me Balling, but every character gets that. Every character gets those moments of growth, and you get to see that these are not the same characters who they were uh, in the first movie. I think most obviously, uh, and actually perhaps even subtly, uh, so like kind of contradictory terms there, but I think most subtly, but yet overtly, uh, Star Lord who is not the like baby man child that we have come to know him in you know the first two volumes that fit his character. 
but he's he's certainly like his playful like kind of like a childlike self but he's he's matured in a way that I think the storyline reflects and one of the scariest things that I thought this movie was going to do that I was like please don't do that they did not do and I was so worried throughout the entirety of the film uh, and they didn't uh, and so I was so pleased with that uh, frankly I, I just need to get into full spoilers because I'm just staying really vague here and I need to just just full-on gush about how much I adore this movie so if you have not seen this I highly recommend this this is quite frankly I I think one of the best Marvel movies and thank God because uh, Marvel has needed this because uh, I have not uh, I have not hated a lot of their movies but they've all felt like just the next thing and it, they're not movies in and of themselves but just trying to sell the next movie or the next big send up for uh, the MCU and just doing a bit of crossover and like shoving a bunch of different elements into it. This is no this is a full thing that's telling its own story no not needing to shove in all the other MCU references uh, and, and it just it, it tells a beautiful story uh, that just has me uh, Sadly, not more excited for the MCU, but definitely more excited for James Gunn's work over in DC Comics. Uh, and I think I frankly only have one critique of the film, and it's not even a major one, and it's one that I'd have to get into like super nuance on to like say what the critique is. So we'll talk about that in spoilers. So with that said, let's talk full spoilers about this thing. Okay, uh, let me just start when I go into spoilers here by just talking about each character and what I think about each one because I think each character just deserves their own discussion. Peter, uh, I think, is the one I'll start with because what I loved most about him is throughout the entire story, you, like I said, he's not that man-child anymore. He's not like acting a baby and like whining all the time because he doesn't get things that he wants. Um, but he is sort of like yearning for Gamora. And I was so worried this entire film that what they were going to do was have Gamora learn to fall in love with Peter again and have her, uh, you know, be like, oh, you know, he is really great uh, and end the movie with them kissing and getting back together. Um, which, you know, would not be the worst thing in the world. It wouldn't have been a horrible ending for these characters, but it would have been just a very rote standard guy gets the girl story that just constantly places women into like, oh, we got, we've got to like be the sort of like end uh, victory for the male character. Um, but here there's so much more nuance in him because Star-Lord yearns after her, but Gamora constantly says uh, with all the time you sci-fi stuff that she's not the same person. Uh, she's not, she's quite literally not the same person, but, uh, you know, metaphorically, she's, she's treated as such by the story, but like as someone who's changed and who isn't with Peter anymore. And it's, the storyline goes that Peter needs to learn that it's okay for him to not need someone else to, uh, to make himself feel whole. He doesn't need to constantly cling to other people, but can become a full person in and of himself. And that he also doesn't need to, like, force her to be what she wants for him, but she can be her own person. And when the end of the movie hit, and Peter uh, has that moment with Gamora, and, and he recognized, like, yes, we were wonderful, um, but Gamora sort of says, like, we're not the same, but, you know, I can respect you, and he accepts that. I thought that was such a beautiful, nuanced note that I really needed this movie to hit, and it, it really does, and I was so glad with that. Uh, going on in next, uh, Nebula. I think too uh, was was so well articulated. She is the one who's just like I've always wanted to be in conflict, always fighting. You know, she's she lived under Thanos, who was a very quite literally a fascist leader who's just always set his underlings in competition with each other. And here now we have seen that she has grown to want to fight and 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 live for family to the point where like she calls Rocket at one point like she calls um she calls him family, and. I, I just so much growth and maturity on her part from the little angry, just vicious person that she was uh, at, at the beginning and having to teach that to, to Gamora, who Gamora throughout the film is a character who, uh, you know, has gone back in some ways because she doesn't have those memories of, uh, you know, the other version of her. And she quite literally uh, has to relearn that same thing that Gamora did, or sorry, um, 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 uh, Nebula did in that she has to like learn that you can accept family and you can't accept people in your life. It doesn't always need to be at odds like the Ravagers are. Uh, and, and getting to see that was just, was so wonderful. Uh, Mantis also too, about learning to be empathetic and, and, and being able to articulate that and understand that for herself and be, be able to stand up for that. She always tries to put the words into someone else's mouth, uh, like Drax's mouth when he's talking to uh, Peter at one point. And she's finally able, when we get the sort of like animals that she sort of, uh, I, I forget, the, the, the aliens from volume two's opening that they encounter and she sort of like reads them and it finds empathy with them. I adored that because it's just her coming into her own and her own ability to find empathy 
empathy and, and definition for herself instead of constantly having to go through others. Um, and it was just the start of that journey. We see at the end of this, she's not fully there yet. She needs to go out and discover herself, but that's who she was, starting to be the person who can find empathy. And I love that these giant monsters are given empathy. So many things throughout this movie, and that's kind of what this movie is about, is about finding empathy for the difference. People not like you, people who are are, are othered and, and sometimes seen as less than, like lesser life forms as quite literally one of the people calls it when, they, when Rocket saves all the smaller animals at the end of the film, um, I thought was, was wonderful. And then Drax, uh, the moment that hit me the most weirdly enough this entire movie was uh, was Drax getting to be a dad again, and how he, and, and Gamora, or sorry, Nebula saying you weren't made to be a destroyer, you were made to be a dad. And when she said that, I just it hit me. It's just reframing his 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 energy as just someone who his sort of his his um, I don't want to say I don't want to say he's not dumb. They call him dumb, but it's not it's not that. It's his straightforward way of seeing the world, and very kind way of seeing the world, and, and very um. Simple, but not in, not in an unnuanced way, but a, a, a sort of more simple way of seeing the world. And I'm not trying to be like he's dumb and like he's simple in terms of that way, but like, and it's not like he just sees things in black and white. But no, it's just very straightforward, very open, very clear. Um, and and I think that that is what allows him to connect with being a father and connect with kids um, who who see the world in that way, but also have the full range of emotion and understanding that Drax does. It's not that he's dumb. It's that he is able to express himself in a very straightforward way that kids who don't have all these tools yet can understand. And that's what makes him a great father. And you see that. And you see the other characters come to terms with that. that, that it's like he's not dumb. He's just straightforward. And that's a way that allows people to, to see the world in a very, see the nuance of the world in a way that they don't have the language to express yet. And I, and I mm, was so happy with that. Um, and... Just I'll save talking about Rocket and uh, the the High Evolutionary Minute because I have so much to say about them. But the rest of the story, I I loved. Just uh, Adam Warlock. Adam Warlock is uh, was also a lot of fun because he is a little fascist boy. Uh, as you quickly see, he's like the guy. He's not even fascist. He's more like a, an employee working for his his boss. I was just the High Evolutionary, and he just wants to like please his mom. You know, he, he reminds me very much of Cyril Karn from Star Wars Andor. In that, you know, he's not as pathetic. He actually is kind of that pathetic, where he is like a, just a guy who like you know I'm just trying to do my job for the boss and I'm trying to get things done. But he's like his mom is always belittling him, and he he never really gets to feel like his own full sense of self and he's just trying to please the others around him. He does horrible like things for the CEO, for corporations, for fascists to do it. The high evolutionary very clearly being a fascist. We'll talk about that. And it, like he literally is put in competition with the other employees of the high evolutionary. Like he literally kills the, uh, what was it, the the, the pig thing uh, that at one point is like, like, we work for the same boss. What are you doing? He's like, yeah, but I want to get paid more. Uh, and so it just talks about like how capitalism quite literally pits people against each other, uh, even though they technically should be working for the same guy and for the same system they pit each other they fight each other and i just loved adam doing that and i love this the movie understanding that he's a bad guy and you know in a little bit of an mcu way not held accountable i would have liked to see some accountability for some of the horrific actions like technically rocket almost dying was his di like direct fault even though he's like pushed into it by the high evolutionary um but uh but he uh but so i would have liked a little bit of like you know him being held accountable for that a tad but this is a marvel movie so i'm willing to let that slide a hair uh, in, in this case to just get to the point where like the movie shows him empathy and shows that we can heal from you know fascist rhetorics um, which then uh, brings me to some of the other elements of this because if we're talking about fascism we have the high evolutionary here who's quite literally a fascist he is uh, <laughs> he is quite literally talking about wanting to create a perfect utopia wanting to breed the like uh, the perfect people and trying to constantly find the way to perfectly breed others uh, and that that is a very fascist narrative a lot of people when they look at like something like the Nazis and you know Hitler's Aryan ideal the thing that they forget is they think like oh Hitler wa uh, thought the Germans of the time that he was like ruling over uh, were his perfect people no what the nuance of uh, Nazism was when it came to the Aryan race was that Hitler believed that if you killed everyone else like genocided like every other people you could ultimately create a perfect Aryan person through the breeding of the Aryan bloodline that 
people today were so like diluted by the dirty, you know, Jewish folks or whatever blood uh, that he could then create an Aryan ideal by breeding and killing everyone else that possibly people would breed with. Again, very eugenics-y way of seeing things, which matches quite literally with what um, with what uh, the high evolutionary is going for. But what the, this movie gets so right with that depiction is he is never satisfied with it. He is never at any point satisfied. He makes his, you get to see this utopia that he builds, which we'll talk about in a second. But even then he's like, these aren't good enough. They, these, there's still riffraff here. There's still people you know, robbing each other. The American crime, we'll get there. Um, you know, so I need to start over, kill them all and start again. Ugh. Even though like, he, he just will never ever be satisfied. There is never a way for him to be satisfied because that's what fascism will never be satisfied because they're just afraid of the way the world actually is. As Rocket literally says, you didn't want perfection. You just hated the way the world is. And, and, and that's just, he's constantly trying to create something that can never be created because human beings or, you know, life is messy. And he's hiding his own uh, fears by, you see it, the mask that comes off uh, of him at the end. He's just this disgusting, uh, like, face. Uh, I, using a little bit of ableism and disfigurement to, like, showcase evil, which is a kind of a tired, unfortunate trope. So there is that element to it. But it does fit metaphorically with what the movie is going for, for to a degree, in a bit of an ableist way. But... Um, but this brings me to what I talked about with Utopia, because what I love, and this is where James Gunn is getting so overtly political, and I adored it, was the fascist utopia that, that the high evolutionary is creating is just American red line suburbia, white picket fence suburbia, where in America, quite literally, they shoved out all the black people from suburbia through redlining and uh, things like that to to just create a perfect little white suburbia and try to sell that as this capitalist thing that's like everyone should want to have the 2.5 fam family all working for the government da, 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 and no black people around and it's using the aesthetics of that for his uh for the high evolutionaries utopia and it's not over doesn't like directly draw parallels to racial issues uh directly because you know they sort of and that's sort of one of my big critiques that i'll talk about in just a second um uh, and it's something that i understand the marvel movie not doing uh because you know they have to kind of be like as be as apolitical seeming as possible seeming is the word there um even though this movie is not political apolitical and any means, but it doesn't really talk directly about racial issues, but using that aesthetic to point out like, yes, the racial I ideal of America at the time was and still is sort of leads into this sort of fascist thinking of a sort of discrimination, bigotry. Um, and I love that like the high evolutionary quite literally says at one point, I went to earth and liked what I saw. I just thought I could perfect it a little bit. And he just makes redlined America suburbia. So clearly the point being said there uh, that I loved and the oh and this brings me to my one Criticism of the film I, and it only is one and it's it's not like an overt like ah uh, that it was awful for this uh, It's more just uh, I could see this being a blind spot or just something Disney kind of forced into it uh, I really love and I'm gonna I apologize in advance. I am going to sweep his name because I always mispronounce names uh, Chuck Woody Iwuji Apologies, I did look it up beforehand to make sure I could pronounce it right, but I know I'm mispronouncing it, but um, he was fantastic as the high evolutionary. However, I, I do have a bit of an issue when you're going to be talking about sort of like fascism within America specifically. It it makes me a tad uncomfortable uh, to uh, to have the um, the bad fascist character be a black man, especially when you place it with an American sort of racial tension history, even if you're evoking the aesthetic of that. Uh, I would highly recommend my friend Princess Weeks did a uh, great video on um, racial, racially sensitive casting uh, that I, I think is a great video that goes into all of that. And so I'll leave it to, you know, black folks to have a larger discussion on that issue if they have an issue with it at all. It was just something that I'm like, this feels like someone at Disney or whoever the casting director was is like, oh, we need to have a diverse cast. So we'll cast a black guy in this role that we have open so we can have more black people in it, which is great. I hear for diversity and things, but not necessarily being sensitive to where they place uh, a person of color, especially a black man within the story that you're telling. Uh, again, no shade uh, at the actor who played the high evolutionary. He is fan freaking tastic uh, So, uh, you know, it's one of those like, I'm not like condemning. It's just one of those things like, yeah, the implications there. I, I don't think it was definitely not intentional, but it is there and it's worth mentioning. Uh, it's one of those like blind spot things. Um, but yeah, just needed to mention that.
Other thing too is we get to see this organic uh, company that uh, that uh, that we visit with Nathan Fillion was a whole bunch of fun, and we get to see like how they're always put at odds with each other to the people that work for that corporation. Um, and I I love. I love that we learned that the High Evolutionary just used this to fund his fascist utopia, that he is the kind of the CEO of this company, because that's what capitalist, uh, that's what capitalism ultimately does. It helps feed sort of fascist ideals because it just sort of helps fund this constant, like pushing competition against each other and sort of feeding into this sort of more fascist project that's sort of always looking for like the, the market determines perfection sort of thing. And so just the subtleties of that, I thought were all so excellent in, in all of this uh, and, and so smartly done. But that comes out emotionally so wonderfully with Rocket Raccoon. And I loved at the end of this, uh, the, the uh, we get the sort of like uh, him almost going into light sequence and uh, the, I figured a name, but the uh, the one animal uh, speaking to Rocket and saying, this was always your story. Because many of us know that Rocket Raccoon was always the sort of James Gunn self-insert. And something that I always spoke about, if you watch my video essay on James Gunn, was James Gunn being uh, open about how he faces a lot, he faced a lot of like the sort of like quote unquote toxic masculinity discussions about him uh, feeling like lashing out at others, doing all of these things, like pushing people away that Rocket did in the first two movies. And here we have Rocket coming to accept that he is, um, you know, part of this family of the Guardians. But we also get to see where he came from and what caused him to feel this anger and pain and not wanting others around him. And it is through the fascist, it is through the high evolutionary sort of, um, sort of instilling in him this idea that there is a perfect utopia and telling him that he matters, that he's, uh, that he's a great thing, but not caring for him at all, just seeing him as this freak, this abomination to be cast aside, this outsider. Um, and, and Rocket sort of feeling disillusioned and lonely because of that, but he also forms his found family. And I love that it's not other raccoons that he makes a found family, but other animals. And I, and so many of the queer feels with this found family that he makes here, like quite literally, the I, I forget the number, but screw the number, uh, the High Evolutionary constantly calls Rocket uh, this number, that's, his, that's the name he gives Rocket, but Rocket chooses his own name. As a trans person, I resonate with that about how like choosing your own name can be oh, you're finding your own identity within these sort of fascist worlds to just see you as a number, as a function, uh, and and getting to uh, getting to uh, get to express your full self uh, in that uh, was was a beautiful uh, thing that just resonated with me. And the high evolutionary constantly. Um, constantly uh, saying that, like dead naming Rocket throughout the whole thing, um, but getting to uh, getting to showcase that Rocket, that's his actual name, and him accepting his full identity and where he came from by finally acknowledging that he's a raccoon when he learns that and protecting those smaller animals was was so wonderful. Um, and it was heartbreaking, the, the moment where the High Evolutionary genocides let's it's it's you know only of three animals but genocide doesn't is not about counting numbers um you can have a genocide of just three and he tries to genocide you know rocket's batch of um family and he does and it's heartbreaking and it's what does set rocket off he does want to push people away because he's angry and hurt and in pain um but what i love about rocket is because the big thing with those sort of stories is you often see like this happened in Star Trek Picard season three is when you have characters who are faced with this trauma from a fascist society and have faced like genocides, um, they are often placed in this anxiety like, oh, they're going to do the genocide to us. Like Rocket Raccoon, uh, like if you look at the Changeling characters in Star Trek Picard season three, spoiler there. Um, uh, and I won't spoil, I'll just say this because I think it's just important to say the, the storyline of the Changeling is they faced a genocide and so then they wanted to do the same to the Federation, right? There's this anxiety that, oh, they're going to do the same to us but that's not what Rocket's story is he goes out and finds another found family and he he finally grows out of his cell it's not that he wants revenge against everybody and to do the same thing to others which is a very sort of like fascist fear F fascist fear that other people want to do fascist to them fascism to them that's why they set themselves in competition that's not what Rocket wants he wants to he wants to have that family again and he gets it with the Guardians and he finally is understanding it and fully accepting that role um, as part of the family in this and it's beautiful and just the fact that this movie ends with so many characters saying I love you expressly saying I love you to each other Groot literally says I love you it's the first non I am Groot things that he says which is broke my heart too in just a beautiful way. It means so much that that is the ultimate expression of all of this. It is just the nuance that James Gunn brings to all of this and his lack of just regurgitating the same sort of anxieties that I see a lot of filmmakers express. Uh, and, and I just, I loved 
I love his understanding of what it means to fight back against fascism and to try to recover and heal some, from fascism that Rocket faces. And not just like, oh, Rocket would want to do the same thing to others. Which is like, Marvel, Marvel does it a whole bunch too. Um, I think uh, freaking uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier did the same thing um, with its villains. You know, we will do a fascism to you now. Um, and, and just James Gunn understanding the nuance, nuance and the difference. Um, and it was, it was just broke my heart in the best way. And to end the movie, uh, and there's so many other, there's so many small things I could have talked about here. Like I saw someone say there's a homophobic joke, uh, one in one of my comments on another video, it's like the homophobic joke in this in movie. I'm guessing what they were referring to is the moment where like, uh, Mantis, uh, uh, tricks the guard into like hitting on, um, on, uh, Drax. But I didn't read that as a homophobic joke. I just read the joke being that Drax is uncomfortable that, uh, Mantis constantly makes like the way they get through things is that like, people fall in love with him. Not that that was like a gay thing, but it was just like Drax is uncomfortable <laughs> thing but in a way that's like not like overtly ter too terrible like she's not like assaulting him or anything it's just like he just is mildly uncomfortable in a kind of funny way uh and i think that that that's like a small nuance again that james gunn does really well and i liked seeing that growth because before james gunn had done a lot of homophobic jokes in uh some of his other works that he had done even before marvel uh and here like you don't get that you don't get those homophobic jokes um even though i can understand where someone could read that that i don't really think that that was the vibe that it was going going for. And I, I thought that that was great. Uh, other small things like Peter almost dying at the end. And I thought they actually were going to kill Peter. And I've been like, that would have been a fine ending for him. But, and, but I also, I like that it's kind of a reference back to the first movie that everyone complained about, like his face being kind of like perfectly icy. Um, and his face like puffs up and gets all like bruised and stuff. And this was kind of funny. He's like, was that cool? Um, was, was really great. Um, and then at the end with all the characters just sort of like having to go their own separate ways to find themselves. They have their found family, but now they, they need to go and find who they are now, recenter themselves, uh, I thought was a really strong en ending. And Rocket getting to be the leader. Uh, it feels a little bit of like James Gunn's like, ah, I'm the leader now, but it really was Rocket's story. Uh, and, and Rocket coming to be able to accept that role that he can be this leader by finding himself and, and coming to accept that role, I thought was beautiful. And Rocket getting to have that and getting to lead the new versions of the Guardians that we get to see at the end was uh, was so great. Um, also, the moments with Sean Gunn's character uh, was also great. We get the little Michael Rooker cameo was beautiful. Uh, the best boy uh, with Cosmo, he's like a good good dog. Uh, I thought was uh, was adorable and sweet uh, and, and just a fun little little bit throughout the whole thing. Um, yeah, I, I could rant for a while and I will because this, this again, I'm going to probably put this uh, review into a video essay format at some point, um, but this is great. Best Mar definitely best Marvel movie of the past like few years since probably since at least since Endgame my my I, I would even say better than um, Spider-Man No Way Home, which I know a lot of people said even better than the Eternals, which is my personal favorite. Uh, I know that's a that's a radical choice for some. I love the Eternals. We'll let, I know it's a messy movie, um, but I have a certain affinity for it. Um, but this is a much better movie than that, I think. Um, but I, I still, uh, uh, you know, I, I just love this movie. And again, doesn't make me excited for more MCU stuff, but certainly makes me more excited for more James Gunn and DC stuff. So we'll go from there. All right. That all being said, what did you think about my, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3? I would love to hear all your thoughts down below and beyond all that. I hope you all, my friends, live long and prosper.